Okay, well, we'll just do the intro question. So this is going to be a presentation on quantitative environmental statistics. And so there's qualitative and quantitative data. Qualitative is um, things like often survey information, uh, interviews, photos can be qualitative and Quantitative is more like numbers, numerical, like it's often stored in spreadsheets. And there can there's a lot of interplay between the two. Like quantitative can become can become qualitative, qualitative can become quantitative. But like that binary isn't really real, and it's only sometimes useful. And in our lab, we we use both, and we're tr and always trying to understand the pros and cons of each in order and like integrate them to like maximize. The use utility and communication of the data and like minimize how like confusing or how limiting different types of data can be and so the, yeah but i just wanted to so give that and say that this presentation is going to be mostly focused on quantitative data and um some general ways to an analyze it but i wanted to do a quick poll and ask everybody i put it in the chat um and i wanted to ask everybody how do you feel about statistics i'm just going to pull up the thing or how does statistics make you feel so if you click on the link in the chat you should be able to um get to this kind of screen and then and then click the smiley put like a tag on the smiley faces and i think you can put multiple tags if you feel like neutral and really happy you can like click both those circles <laughs> this is kind of awesome <laughs> Oh, you know, it's interesting. We're kind of making a bell curve or a normal curve where most people are in the middle and then like the values like taper off towards the ends. That's some that'll come back later. We'll talk about what an, what normality means. Does anyone want to like give like a, a couple of sentences about like why they um put a tag on any of the faces that they did i can explain mine can you yeah. can you all hear me yeah okay so i put two i put one on the, like the one on the very left the red one and then i put one on like the slightly green one but not the very green one and i did that just because um I, I think the concept of statistics is interesting. Like, um, I think gathering like a bunch of data and kind of making sense of it is really cool. Um, but it can get like really frustrating. Um, I'm not super like well versed in like R or like other um, statistics software. So it can get a little frustrating when I don't know what I'm doing. But um, when it does work, it's it's really interesting. Yeah, I can jump in as well. I think I put one on like the slightly happy and another one in the slightly, I don't know if it's angry or sad, um, disappointed. Um, I think I like the concepts behind statistics and I, and I think in my career, I'm gonna like constantly be using stats. Um, at the same time, I only learned SAS and I had to really struggle to learn that and I really need to learn R. So I think there's kind of a figure that I'm, if I go into a PhD, I'll be doing There'll be too much statistics that I'm acting like I can handle, and there's going to be like a kind of shock there. So that's the fear. But I, I definitely appreciate the concepts behind them and its use and stuff. Yeah, does it, anyone, someone want to give like a one, one final reflection? I really resonate with every, everything uh, everyone's saying so far.
uh, Chelsea, I'm gonna pick on you. Do you have, how do you feel? What did you put your um, tags on? Which faces? So sorry, my volume <laughs> is not that high. Uh, I put it in neutral in neutral because I feel like I'm both semi happy with like stats like it's very useful and I think like the concept is is I guess like applicable and you know helpful but it's also frustrating and like when I don't know which like analysis to do, it's really hard to find information on the internet about it. And like, I don't always remember everything from my stats class. So that's, I think what makes it difficult sometimes. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I, um, so I like, I'm hearing like threads, I'm like, okay, well, it's important in theory, like concepts and ways to like analyze and manage data are useful, but it's like the how is really frustrating and all of the software and like like additional information you have to know, like on top of your actual like study site or whatever it is, is, is just like a lot. And information is also kind of, kind of constantly changing. Um, and so we'll talk about a little bit of that. And I think, that um, some general comments to like ground like this presentation is that I'm not going to go into the depth of the calculus involved. Um, and oftentimes, like you don't even you don't need to know the calculus or the math behind any of the equations or like how to calculate standard deviation like by hand. Sometimes it's helpful. I guess sometimes it's like helpful to learn that so that you can like better understand the equation, but it's like not necessary. There, I like I know plenty of professors who don't um, who have no idea like what the math behind running a t test or an ANOVA is, but like they do it all the time and we'll publish about it. So personally, like I've also like I've never really taken higher level math courses, and for stats, it's like not super necessary if you can kind of um, let yourself be okay with not knowing the like the calculus behind everything. Um, and stats is kind of an art. Chelsea was kind of alluding to this where like there are, it's like there's kind of unclear information online where like the, their rules are not very definitive and they're super situational. So like if, if there's like, if depending on what your study and data looks like, everything can be different, which is a part of what makes statistics so difficult, so hard. Um, and I think something to really recognize is that there's no such thing as objective science um, and that oftentimes institutions and people will say that um, like a statistic is unbiased or um, or like foolproof or like it'll be like the be all end all of like what's right and what's wrong is a p-value and that's just not true statistics is created by like a stolen information and is like a set is like often a settler colonial method that is like informed by systems of oppression. And then as a result, statistics is biased. So there's no way it can be completely objective. Nothing is. And this article, I think, doesn't talk specifically about statistics, but like science in general, and talks about objectivity. And there's a lot of other pieces out there on like the false, the myth of object of, of objective science and so on. But a quote that I like from this article um, is that scientists rarely interrogate the history, even of their own discipline. When I studied engineering at university, I was expected to write just one essay on ethics in four years. No wonder that new technologies perpetuate racial and gender stereotypes or that automatic facial recognition struggle to identify people with darker skin. And so like, I mean, I really resonated with that because there's, I've been in school for like, I don't know, like for like almost, uh, I've been in like higher education for almost a decade. I've never had to take a, ethics course, I've never had to understand positionality. I've never in a course been like to ask to think about objectivity and bias. And that's like a huge, that's a huge issue. And it's incredibly important that we understand like who we are and where we're coming from and where our like scientific tools are coming from. Um, 
and part of that is like positionality. I know so, like some of us in this lab group like think about and have like worked on positionality in different ways, and um, that's like incredibly important. Um, and also like feel free to like unmute yourself and like like button in if you want me to explain something again or slow down or you can like type in the chat. I have it open on the side so I can see. And the next few slides, I mean, are gonna be a little bit like big picture and a little bit like can, yeah, it's like, there are also some heavy topics, but feel free to like take the space that you need if you need to step away or like get some water, like whatever it is, um, do what you need to do. So I wanted to give some of the context around statistics and like math and science in general, like originally it was used in very practical ways to make decisions about things like food storage, military tactics, et cetera. And often only those with like social capital could like be doing that work. And that's still true to this day. And this means that only like specific subsets of people with power in society are the ones doing the science. And this is going to immediately bias everything. So then the people that are creating statistical tests are not like are not uh, representative of like larger populations of people. And so the tests themselves, like the math that created them is a biased like equation. And statistics is a long history of trauma and um, and oppression and in the US with, and across the world with experimenting on marginalized groups of people. You can Google the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, forced, steril forced sterilizations of native women. Um, you can Google anything about the eugenics movement and so on. There's like too many examples that also still go on today. And so statistics comes from a lot of the, the like medical and psychological like racism and anthrop anthrop quote unquote anthropology uh, so, and statistics that we use today is racist, is often used as a tool of the state, the colonial government, and is consistently been used by those in power to dehumanize and subjugate people globally. And so it's really important to like know these things and know these histories because when we apply them to our environmental data, like, like these histories are still, these legacies are still there. It's not, we can't remove the, um, where these tools come from. And to, to this day, statistics and, da and data science and big data is directly linked to data capitalism, policing, expanding colonial powers, eugenics, race science, medical apartheid, and settler colonial ways of knowing. And I'll sh I'm going to just put a bunch of these. I have all the citations here. I'm going to put a bunch of them in the chat. Um, how do I do this? There's, they're all like really, really good resources. And specifically, this one has been, it was shared with me recently by Dr. Lydia Jennings. It's called Data Capitalism and Algorithmic Racism and really gets into like big data and like policy structures and how data capitalism and statistics are a result of the transatlantic slave trade. A quick question. Yeah. So I was curious, um, I was wondering if you could just clarify so definitely it seems like there's a lot of points where physics could be like utilized as a tool for racism or as like a method. But I was wondering like how are statistics themselves racist? I'm not sure if like maybe that's like a definition semantics thing that I'm not catching on to. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like, it's a tool and it's been, is created by um, like racist people and institutions to be used by racist people and institutions. And I think it is possible to reclaim those tools but i don't really think anyone is i don't think that many people are are doing it successfully because i think even um like what we do in our lab is is trying to reclaim to statistics and like employ them for environmental justice and there's also an aspect of our work that um just like that perpetuates the same system, the, the, all those systems. And I think like one thing that I think about is um, map, like, and like, I think the Howell project brings it up like pretty clearly for me is like, and like mapping resiliencies and vulnerabilities. 
that's those are statistical methods and like like mathematical methods to do that mapping and all of that and um that can be then misused and that can be used by corporations to maybe say like oh these are the most vulnerable communities let's do something here and um yeah i, I guess like there are I, I do wonder like how do we reclaim these tools and how do we use them in, in yeah, ways I mean, that aren't, aren't so informed by this yeah thing? and i think i was just wondering because i mean i just don't want to um negate the work of like like historically oppressed groups that are statisticians themselves and like um that's why yeah i, I just want to make sure the terminology but that's clear because i think there's if like people use if it if it is just a tool even if it does have a, a background that comes from racist institutions if it's a tool that's being used to combat racism or recognize racism because i mean in the game public health we use statistics all the time to identify racism and to as like a tool to um to show it exists and to make that clear so so that's, so that's why i was curious how itself is racist if it's so often used um by like a lot of different people to study racism yeah i think that like yeah like where that comes in for me is like it's used like unintentional it's like not used intentionally to like or like with an understanding of like where of like the history around the tools and um because of that then like those histories are just are, are perpetuated I think there uh, recently AGU posted this blog that talks about um, the Maori arrival in New Zealand, but they revealed an Antarctic ice cores based on soot found in the ice cores and they traced um, traced that and dated it and like said like a date that the um, Maori arrived in Aotearoa and the like the I, re, I read the paper and this blog it also talks about um how they didn't work with like maori communities or leaders in this research or like, in any way and that research and like all the statistics they did and analyses they did were like void of context and relationship to the people and the land that they were, the lands that, and like environmental like the materials that they were studying and i just yeah i just wanted to put that as an example of how um statistics are, are, are still used in environmental work as a way to um continue to like exclude people and now that and like whether or not they these um the dates of arrival like match up with what like maori history says it's like colonial governments and like the powers that be are going to believe the scientific paper over over like the over like marginalized communities over the maori and like that maybe these like the scientists were like oh like these statistics are awesome like we're gonna like use this modeling to like like get like to like put some concrete dates on when people arrive that's that, that's so important and it's also like that might directly contradict what those people say, and it's like one form of knowledge, one way of understanding dates and arrival and, and, and movement that the like colonial governments will like take above all else. And like I, these researchers didn't think about that when they did this work. Um, and, so, and, and so we we have to, like that's what I'm I'm calling for. And so some frameworks that help think about these, how data and statistics are used and like what they mean are that um, I'm gonna I'm gonna list some of them that I, I've been learning learning about recently. So there are the care principles for indigenous data governance. They're not sovereignty, um, although they're related. Uh, so they are here: collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. And so these are principles to um, yeah guide indigenous data governance and data governance. Data sovereignty is that. Um, indigenous peoples have the right to steward their their people's lands, etc. And um, is not sovereignty is not a, like given by like a federal government or a, or definitely not given by a colonial government. It's inherent to indigenous communities. And data, data sovereignty means that those communities have indigenous peoples have the right to steward their 
data and where those data come from, the people, the lands, the environments, the computers, et cetera. Because of like historic misuse and, and, and like trauma. And then the FAIR principles of open science are, is another framework and FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And this, these are really about, okay, how do we make data really like able to be integrated and used broadly? And sometimes the care and FAIR principles contradict each other because some data like, as like I've been learning and as I, as I now like really like like strongly believe like some data should not be accessible to everybody and some information is like shouldn't be interoperable like a lot of data and information is site specific and actually can't be compared to another or aggregated without losing what makes that data like like relevant and important and like there's always ways to like increase the metadata and like add more and more variables to like define things but i think there's something to be said about um open science and like this idea for like universality which isn't which isn't very real like true or realistic in my opinion uh and then stephanie carroll who um is a professor at the u of a um has also written about the overlap between the care and fair principles and how to work with them together uh, so this figure just gives a quick like comparison of those principles with open data principles. I won't get into this one. Um, but all these frameworks are, are like really useful for me to and like as like at like a big picture, like high level, how do I think about data? How do I think about information? And then how does that trickle down to the kinds of questions I ask and the kinds of statistics I run? We our lab also like strives to do community first reporting and like so data goes into the hands of community members and participants first. And then something that a few, a few of us have been thinking about is community owned and operated data. I'm not going to go into details about those because I don't know, I don't know as much about them. Um, but I also want to know that institutions get in the way of doing your work well and equitably. Like it would be awesome to employ all these frameworks, but we can't because the like institutions we're a part of like don't allow it. They don't have any precedent. They don't um they're like whatever policies oh like this data has to be peer reviewed before you can go and put it on instagram like that directly goes against community first reporting and any kind of like science science communication goals that we have but at times it feels like we're limited by and and i mean we're definitely limited by and like barred by the institutions we're in and so um there's always yeah there's all uh, there's always some level of like how do we work around these systems to employ the frameworks that we care about? Um, any questions on the last few slides or frameworks? I I know I put a bunch of like citations in the chat. I'm also going to share the slides with everybody, and like they're in the in the notes part of the slides. Um, so you'll have all the things. Yeah, I do have like a quick practical question. So I think for me, I mean. Culturally, I just come from a background that's very statistics. I, mean, I did like biology, micro, um, and ecology. Um, so at least in my like personal toolkit culture, um, it's not like I'm drawing from my own like oral history or other forms of knowledge. Um, especially when it comes to more like environmental or conservation or ecology work, um, how like how what are we practically supposed to do? Because I because I don't have like my own personal oral history, so. The only tool, the main tools I have are statistics. Would that just be consulting people, like local cultures and local tribes, or like, like what, what would that look like practically? Yeah, I mean, I think that's like that's the question I also like really struggle with. I also have a background in biogeochemistry, environmental statistics, ecology, and there's like there's no like I think what I've come to is like oh this work is like is incomplete like if we're just doing these like ecological survey and then like using ANOVAs to look at the data like that result is incomplete because we're, we're using and employing one very strict way of knowing and way of understanding the like ecosystem or group of people or 
group of organisms or even the group of microbes in the, on, the, on the lab bench. We're using like one, and even if we're using like three different anal like analytical methods, it's like one, they're all co usually coming from one way of knowing, one like a settler colonial, like Western scientific way of understanding those microbes, that ecosystem, et cetera. And so I think what I really am trying to understand and trying to learn how to do is mixed methods in terms of like mixed epistemologies, how to, like, what are different ways of knowing that, um, and like that have different like practical methods. And I don't always know, but I have a couple examples at the end of this. And I think it's also important to recognize that settler colonial science and Western methodologies are often stolen indigenous, stolen black and stolen brown technologies that data, like ways of, um, assessing like plant health and like soil nutrients are directly stolen from West African, enslaved West African farmers. Like a soil pH test is, that, um, is, a, is a West African like farming tradition at, or farming practice. And a, like te the texture by field test that soil scientists do, like with like you wet a little bit of soil in your hand and then depending on how long of a ribbon it makes, that like gives you the texture of it. That's a, that's a West African farming, like indigenous farming technique that Russian soil scientists have decided is a like settler colonial method. And so often, and that's like that history happens over and over and over and over again, where settler colonial societies will just steal information and say that it's like their methodology and apply it to everything. So they lose this, they lose the site specificity, they lose the cultural context, and they, um, and they, they lose the people and, and like organisms that informed that work. And so I think part of the solution is to then kind of is like reverse that process. How do we reclaim tools, acknowledge where they came from and incorporate many, many different ways of understanding like a research question or something like that. That makes sense. So it seems, cause I, I think the main thing, at least for me is like, I think for like health or more like social science focused the way that we view that, it's very easy for me to picture that. But I think if I'm like researching just straight up animals, it's like, so, so it, it seems, I, I don't want to put words into your mouth. It seems like the, what you're suggesting is more like really just contextualizing whatever we're doing to what are like the knowledge that already has been in place from either like local or indigenous or oppressed peoples. I, yeah, I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth if that's not true. That's, that's at least no, what I'm getting from it. Yeah, that's part of it. I mean, contextual, context, contextualizing for sure. But then there's also like literal like methods of understanding and being in relationship with like a group of animals that is also like a method of understanding like whatever environmental process and like I don't necessarily know what they are but like that is that is part of that is like there are other methods out there than like some like survey or whatever like behavioral pick, like analysis yeah that makes sense that makes sense so like kind of having the humility to recognize that your method is the only way yeah that's awesome yeah. thank you so yeah, going off that, I actually got a question too. Yeah. It's kind of, is it kind of like, um, because the way it's sounding like is, is that, at least from my perspective, is that when sometimes approaching environmental uh, subjects and activities, it's kind of like, how can we use this? How can we, how can we use this to our advantage? How can we exploit this? How can we apply this? How can we do, rather than saying, and it seems like from your method, it sounds like, it isn't thinking that way of like, how can we use this? How can we exploit this? How can we apply this? How can we use this to our advantage? It's saying, how can we understand the aspects and the principles that they fulfill? And how can we apply those aspects and principles to other scenarios and other things so that it isn't just that, that's just fulfilling it. It's us designing and understanding how they fulfill those roles kind of like that is it yeah i think that's that's definitely like one way to look at the like environmental um questions and i think like it, ha it has to be different wherever you go and whatever like research questions and lands that you're working with like the way you do do the work it has to be like unique to that to that place all right then thank you um so then I, after like, like learning about all these frameworks and like understanding a lot of the 
like histories of oppression, I'm like, well, then what's the point? Like, what is the use of statistics? Like, am I, am I just like perpetuating all these harms by running an ANOVA and like sidelining all these other ways of knowing that are continually marginalized um, in favor of like a p-value? And what's the point of like using this p-value? It feels unethical. Um, and I don't know, like I have a, lot of, I have a bunch of questions here that I don't have the answers to. Um, I would love if some, like, someone could just like volunteer to read out this first question and then there, there'll be a few more too. Sure, um, can we reclaim these technologies to abolish the systems that created them? The next one. How do we expand our ideas of statistically significant away from only p values? And this one. Uh, what is the point of data and how is it used to perpetuate harm even when there are good intentions? And last question. Actually, I want to talk about this a little bit. So what are other ways to synthesize information and present an, an analysis? And this is getting back to what um, I think Hayes and Jacob were talking about and asking is like, what are the other methods? Um, I think oftentimes in the in environmental work, the focus, there's a hyper focus on quantitative data like and numbers and qualitative analysis often lends itself more to other ways of knowing and like less settler colonial ways of knowing. Um, and storytelling is a way of synthesizing information that is an analysis that is important music etc i have a mentor at uh, university of vermont who was doing research on um, students of color's relationship to land and how that connected to their like at schooling in an, in an environmental program there were all the students were studying ecology and she was like trying to understand like how their relationship to place shifted over the course of their program and so on. And so her the message, data collection methods she employed were photo voice. So the people in the study were um, taking photos of the, the different places they were in, the different environments they were in, and writing essays and um, and like doing like interviews on, on Zoom. And so then she started much in the same way that we do an analysis in our lab with interviews and like the focus group data. Um, dog is super annoying. Um, much of the way we do analysis in, in our lab where we code every, we transcribe all the interviews and focus groups. We get these um, um, like, like transcripts of what everyone said. And then we put it through in vivo, which is a software and code everything. Okay, this sentence is associated with this theme and this sentence is associated with this theme and this node. And then we end up we end up getting counts. Okay, this this participant had this many like codes that were talking about memory recall or whatever it is. And then we show a bar graph where we do some kind of analysis on that um, on that data. And then we also like we pull out important quotes. So that's like the more qualitative piece of it. We sit with the information and um, and think, okay, what what are like very important pieces of information coming out, what, what is the participant voice and things like that. And so my mentor was doing the same thing with the interviews and stuff. And she was like, this is, this is like, this is not working. Like it's not bringing, it's not bringing up what is important from this research process and from everyone's stories. And so she decided to dig into her, her own um, traditions and her own um, uh, like storytelling and like kind of information sharing practices and decided that she was going to sit with all of the information. She listened to the interviews um, over the like every, every day over the course of a couple of months. She would look at the photos before going to bed. She would reread all the transcripts every couple of days and really sit with it. And slowly, slowly, she used that, her, her being with and sitting in all the information to um, write poems. And for each person in the study, she created a, a different poem that brought to light all the important themes and pieces of information that they talked about. And then in her paper, in her dissertation, um, that was that was like the analysis and that was the visualization, like the statistical analysis was the poem for each person that was then like presented. And so that's, a, that's a, 
the way she did that and how she did that process was very much rooted in her like indigenous Filipino way, Filipino ways of knowing and stepped away from like coding and in vivo and these more like settler colonial like methodologies. I just, I just, I wanted to give that really like strong example because that's what, that's the one I'm like, I had the most experience with. And all that being said, it's just important to know how to do like the like quantitative settler colonial statistics. Um, and so I'm going to talk about now some basics in environmental data, how to pick an analysis and workshopping an example. And we only have 15 minutes left, so we might we probably don't have time to workshop an example, but we'll do that in another um, session. So environmental data is can, it can be really okay yeah and th this is definitely recorded so you can watch the last 15 minutes later um and environmental data is like super can be super complicated we're often in the field or in working with people we're not um in the lab where we can't control every single variable and we have really complicated experimental design these are just some examples i'm not going to i'm not going to go into detail about what they mean, but just know that there's a lot of different ways to set up a field field site. Um, often the terrains we're working with are really complex. This shows a map of um, the estate Little Princess here, which is a um, a former sugarcane plantation on the island of St. Croix. I'm trying to plan a study here, and it's complicated because there's the sugarcane plantation here, and we are trying to look at the impacts of the transatlantic slave trade on soil structure. But like some of the soil has eroded and gone to the ocean. There's like been a lot of development around the plantation. And so the environments work, we, we work with are really complex. Um, sometimes we have like huge amounts of data and we're working with like real time like moments. So this is, shows a photo of a military training exercise. And maybe there's like an air sampler off to the side that is like getting continuous data over the course of like 10 hours. How do you even work with that kind of information? Um, sometimes we work with people and like these vegetables are coming from a participant in, from Project Harvest in um, uh, desert crops growing in their garden. And they're like, they wanna know what are the metals in, this, in these plants. So we have really important information, really complicated information, data about environments that people are interacting with every day and sometimes even eating. These are soils from around Arizona. And we have, we work in environmental science has like so many different media. There's air, there's plants, there's soil, there's rainwater, there's people um, and so on and so on. And so things are complicated. Um, I'm gonna skip this, or yeah, any questions right now so far? And so because things are complicated, statistics can be useful to like make all of that make sense. And so some of the first things that you do with the, when you get your data set is to calculate summary statistics or descriptive statistics. And I know that Monica and I have talked to some of you about, about that. And um, that is often calculating a mean or an average, standard deviation, et cetera. These are some examples of other summary statistics. And this is kind of the first step to get a sense of like, okay, what is even going on with this spreadsheet or with this data? What is the, what are these summaries by different import overall? What are the summaries by different variables that we're interested in? Uh, so I just wanted to put this up to explain what a mean and standard deviation was. Uh, and so the mean is like, is an average. It's the sense of what's like the, um, um, average value from a data set and standard deviation is add some uh, concept of variability to that because we know like the, the mean is this middle piece here. And we know that this whole data set is represented under this curve and the mean gets at like one point in this data set. Like it doesn't tell us anything about how high the values went or how, how low the values went. So people calculate a standard deviation, which tells us um, some variability. And so it gives us this 
calculation, okay, we can say the mean and the standard deviation is like plus or minus two. That means 95% of our data in this sample is like the is at the mean or two units above the mean or two units below the mean. And so it's a really common way to just represent a, a data set pretty quickly. Um, there's also, you can look do calculate standard errors and 95% confidence intervals. Um, those aren't technically descriptive, they're inferential estimates. Um, so it's more of like a statistical analysis and you can look up exactly like what that means and how to calculate them. Uh, but sometimes different fields require standard error. Some of them like don't want standard error, um, but it's really, it's, it's kind of like dependent on the field you're in and, and the analysis you're trying to do at the end. Um, visualization is also really important in statistical analysis. So often like once you calculate some of those like summary stats, it's important to visualize them to see what they look like, see what the trends are. And um, we do, a, we spend a lot of time on this in our lab because it's really important to visualize data for participants. And this just shows a bunch of different ways. A lot of the time I'll take my whiteboard out and just like sketch, sketch out graphs before I make them to be like, okay, what's going on here? Would this be useful? I think tables are also a form of visualization. And then this is called a box plot, which shows the midi median and a bunch of other statistics that are meant to represent like the range of the data, including outliers and so the what the visualization what the visualization can do it can show us okay maybe in hayden this plot shows concentrations of arsenic in the in rainwater while a smelter in hayden was operating in purple and then while it was shut down in blue as so we see there's a difference there's definitely a difference here there doesn't seem to be too much of a difference in winkelman but we can visually see this maybe this is where do running a statistical test on to see if this difference is significant. And in terms of, I'm now going to talk about some two like important concepts for most statistical tests. The first one is normality. And so normality is a way to describe the distribution of a data set. So this shows a histogram where on the X axis, you have concentrations of arsenic. And on the Y axis, you have frequency. So this is like the number of samples that have, like this first bar here, the tall one, shows that the number of samples that have concentrations of arsenic between 0 and 10. Uh, and that's like over 100 samples. And um, we can like lay out our data like this to see the distribution. So this here is not a normal distribution because it doesn't show um, like, where is this is kind of like a normal distribution where it's like a very nice even bell curve and statisticians have just been like that's what we want this is like what the environment this is like the natural distribution of data and that's probably racist I think it came from the eugenics movement um, and we use it all the time now and that, well, most of our statistical analyses are based off of normal data. And so you can see here, my data originally is not normal. It doesn't have that nice bell curve or whatever. But then it's really common to transform data. So apply an equation to make, your, to make your data look normal. So that's what I've done here is I've taken the natural log of every single value. And now when I do the distribution, the x-axis scale is completely different. And it goes from negative two to four but now it shows a mostly normal distribution and I can run most of my statistical tests now. So normality is, can, is very important for stats because if data isn't normal, it's called non-normal or it's called um, non-parametric. And that is, there's like a slew of tests that you can run on non-parametric or non-normal data but they often have less, um, less power. So they're a little bit less useful. So you kind of always want normal data. Another important concept is linearity. A lot of tests 
require linearity. And so that just means, is there a linear relationship between your variables? So this showed arsenic and lead concentrations. It's just a scatter plot. And I just put like a, like a line of regression, like a line of best fit through it to see if there's a linear relationship. So it seems like there is. As lead increases, arsenic increases. As arsenic decreases, lead decreases. That shows a linear relationship. If, it was, if this scatter plot was like kind of like a random cloud and the line was flat, that would mean there's no, there's no linear relationship. Um, a note that this is hard to look at if you have categorical variables. So if I was having like with the Hayden example from before, like you, it's, it's, it's not easy, you, it's impossible to look at linearity with these variables um, because you can't do a scatter plot, but you can look at the residuals and um, I won't get into details about that, but you can ask me questions when you get to your data about what the residuals mean. Um, and again, similar to like, if, okay, if your best case scenario data is normal and linear, but if it's not, there are ways to analyze nonlinear data, but they're a little bit, just like slightly more complicated. Any questions so far? And in the last few minutes, I'm just going to show some examples of how to pick your analysis. Okay. And so the first thing to think about is like, what's your goal? Like, what do you want to do with your data? Are you testing a specific hypothesis? Are you answering a community member's question? Are you trying to inform future projects? Are you trying to predict a value? Are you um, trying to compare your data to a federal standard? Like, what's your goal? Because then that goal is gonna inform what kind of test you run. And so honestly, what I do is once I have my goal, I like write out my research questions on my whiteboard or my like lab notebook, and I like match it up, match up the question with my different data. I'm like, okay, well, I can look at, if I want to look at um, what are there differences in con concentration further away from the smelter in Hayden? Okay, what's the data I need to answer that question? I need concentration data. So I need my arsenic and lead. I need, I also need to know how far each home is from the smelter. And then I have those two data sets. Okay, now what kind of what kind of statistical tests do I run? I just Google like, what test should I run flow chart, statistical test flow chart. And there's so many different charts that come up. This is an example. And then I just kind of follow the path so like, um, and end up, there's always a suggestion at the end of a test to run. And it's just a place to start because these are not comprehensive. They don't have every, they don't have every single analysis, but it's a really good place to kind of narrow, narrow down um, what your options are to make things a little bit less overwhelming. I like this flowchart a little bit better, but, so I thought we could go through it together. So on my question of like arsenic in, in, the, in proximity to the smelter, is my data categorical or continuous? So the outcome, outcome would be con contamination. So is arsenic concentrations, are, is that continuous or categorical? It's continuous data. So we're gonna go on this side of the tree. And from before, we're looking now we're looking at normality or how pa or par parametric. So my data originally was non-parametric, right? It was it had, didn't have that normal bell-shaped curve, but then I transformed it. And so then my data is now normal. And so we're gonna go down this parametric side of things. And then um, I want to look at a correlation, right? So is constant are concentrations correlated with distance from the smelter? So then this analysis would be a Pearson's R. Um, another question is to look at how does concentrations in Hayden versus Winkleman differ? And for that, we would be comparing the mean. And then are your samples independent or are they paired? This is kind of complicated for environmental data because 
most of the time environmental data is paired and like is not independent because we're in the field and there's so many variables we can't control for but people kind of just assume that their samples are independent um and so let's say we do that our data is independent and now we're looking at homogeneity another thing that a lot of the time people just assume their data is homogeneous so i'm not going to go into what that means and people will just run an ANOVA most times, an ANOVA or a t-test. And an ANOVA is a type of regression, and there are like tons of types of regressions. And this is what I used in my thesis. And this is just another flowchart, but I wanted to just highlight that it shows a bunch of different regressions as well. And so the workshop, I'm gonna send out a doodle poll to like schedule, we'll go into details of like what these tests are and how to run them. I just wanted to introduce these topics and that we can use a bunch of different programs to analyze our data. I use Excel and RStudio the most, but you can use a lot of different ones. And there's a lot of different resources as well. Um, the U of A library has a data cooperative and they have gone to a lot of these people for help and they're really awesome with any level of question, basic to really complicated. Um, and they also have workshops. And I posted this in, and I sent an email to everybody, but there's also the ENVS staff encoding Slack that I created last year. And there's also the UVA has a data science Slack and they have options in like R and like hypercomputing stuff. And you can ask questions, like people ask all kinds of questions from like, how do I like what do I how do I like how do a t test? Can someone help me to like um, someone can like I don't know post like a whole like chunk of code and be like there's an error error in here? Can someone debug this? And like I don't even know what that means, but like people are people are helping out. All right, I know I'm a couple minutes over, so I'll stop there. And I also know that like I just threw a ton of information. Take your time to sit with it. And we're gonna we'll go through all the statistical tests um, that would be helpful for folks in the workshop. And so you'll bring your data, and we'll like figure out what um, what to do. And I have some time if anyone wants to stay over and ask any questions. Thanks, Kunal. That was awesome. Yeah, if I don't see any questions, but if anyone wants to also message Kunal afterward, and I'm really looking forward to the workshop to see the details of, of going into what to choose. But I really appreciated the overview of like positionality as well. And if any of you are struggling with that as you move forward with your projects, I'm available to talk about that. I know Kunal, it seems like you'd be like more than down to work through that because that's another thing that can come up too is understanding like how you as a researcher come into your own work and how that relates to what you see coming out of the project. Um, so that's something we couldn't really do a workshop on, but it, there would definitely be things that, that come up um, that we're all more than happy to, to talk about. All right. I'll see you all next week. Uh, I'll send, yeah, and I'll send out the slides for everybody also. Yeah, that'd be great.